Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone. A warm welcome to Chatham House uh, for the final event in the Chatham House EIG webinar series on Asia Pacific in the dynamic world. Uh, you know, previous sessions have focused on uh, uh, trade and supply chains, the US-China relationship and technology and inclusion. I'm very pleased, my name is Vasuki Shastri, I'm an associate fellow here at Chatham House. We're delighted for that for the fourth and uh, final session, uh, we are focusing on uh, uh, a very critical issue on how Australia views regional uh, security in Asia. Particularly, I think it's very appreciated that we set up this event. Uh, of course, we are meeting in the shadow of the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis. Some of you might wonder you know, how relevant is the issue of uh, discussing uh, Australian perspectives on regional security at a time uh, when Europe, uh, or at least a por portion of Europe is in flames. But I think it's absolutely relevant that we have this conversation now. And of course, Russia, Ukraine has triggered a few developments in the region of North. Uh, we of course have uh, the US releasing its long planned Indo-Pacific strategy uh, that came out last week. The Quad leaders, of course, comprising Australia, Japan, India, and the US had a virtual meeting uh, uh, late last week. And so there is a flurry of interest in what all of this means uh, for Asia and Australia. And that, that really is the topic of the conversation today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank EIG, our sponsors, for you know, uh, uh, really setting up this webinar series really making sure that it's driven by substantial research and intellectual input. Today's uh, 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 webinar is on the record. We are, we, are, we are recording this for dissemination in a few weeks. I'd now like to take the opportunity to introduce our uh, wonderful uh, uh, speakers. Uh, we have with us uh, this morning, our lead speaker, Alexander Downer, who's executive chair of the International School of Government at King's College in London. Uh, Mr. Downer, of course, has had a distinguished career in, in Australian politics and diplomacy uh, for the last few decades. Uh, he was foreign minister, the longest serving foreign minister, I still think uh, between 1998 and 2007. Uh, he was Australia's high commissioner to the UK until very recently. So we're delighted to have him to share his perspectives on how he viewed these issues. When I was a journalist in, uh, in Singapore and Indonesia in the 1990s, I think I may have myself attended over a dozen press conferences uh, of Mr. Downer, both in Jakarta and Singapore. This really signals you know, his long association, uh, familiarity with the region. Uh, unfortunately, Huang Le Tu, our second speaker from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute is unable to join us uh, today. Uh, we have with us uh, a, a very, very uh, a good substitute speaker in UGA. Many of you will know UGA, the senior fellow focusing on China here at uh, Chatham House. And then we have Ben Bland, who at the moment is uh, Southeast Asia Program Chief of the Lowy Institute in Sydney. I'm delighted, of course, to announce that in a few months' time, uh, Ben will be moving to London and to Chatham House uh, uh, to be the new director of the Asia Pacific Program, taking over from Champa, who left us uh, late last year. So we hope this is going to be a very interactive discussion. I will get our lead speaker, Mr. Downer, to uh, start the proceedings. Uh, he will be followed by Ben, and then UJ is going to serve as a discussant. Uh, to offer us her comments on, on how, how, how China is looking at uh, this entire issue. Uh, so, you know, please start sending me your questions. We have the Q&A button, the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, without further ado, I'd now like to turn to Mr. Downer for his opening remarks. Thanks very much and um, good morning um, and good evening to everybody. It's a huge pleasure to participate in this Chatham House seminar, particularly at this pivotal time in international affairs. 
Um, my basic hypothesis in talking about Asia Pacific security, Indo Pacific community uh, security, as we increasingly refer to the region now, um, my key hypothesis is that we have reached a watershed moment. And it is the Russian invasion of Ukraine that will, will resonate very substantially throughout the security of the Indo-Pacific region. And so later in my remarks, I'll explain what I mean, because that might seem slightly counterintuitive to you. Let me just qu uh, quickly explain what the strategy for most countries in the Indo-Pacific has been, and for Australia very specifically, going right back into the, um, into the 1980s. We um, in Australia had a, had a policy which used to come up under the rubric of engagement with Asia, um, is now increasingly engagement with the Indo-Pacific, which was built around the concept of developing an elaborate uh, system of networks uh, throughout the region. And other countries in the region have taken that view as well. The more we are able to network with each other, the more we're able to build an Asia Pacific, particularly um, earlier on, an Asia Pacific, a, a sense of Asia Pacific community, the more we'll be able to achieve both the stability and the prosperity that um, we aspired to. Um, and now that network was built around a variety of different structures. Um, at the political level, there were multilateral, there are multilateral structures um, in, in particular um, generated out of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. There's um, the ASEAN Regional Forum, which brings together once a year most of the foreign ministers of the region and some beyond, such as the, um, the EU. The UK is now a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum. Um, um, in the mid 2000s, we uh, created the East Asia Summit process, bringing together the leaders of now 18 then 16 of the major um, countries of the of the region the the other two who were added were the united states and interestingly enough russia um, um, a little bit later um, so we we developed this multilateral architecture at the political level also i think it's become politically well it became politically significant um, even though it was economic um, was apec the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, um, which brings together um, the major economies of the Asia Pacific region, extending across to Canada and, uh, um, and some of the countries of uh, Latin America. Um, from Australia's point of view, we also built um, as, um, our bilateral relationships up um, throughout the region. I mean, uh, I think I can mention all of the agreements we reached with those countries, but Significantly, um, we concluded the Lombok tr Treaty, which was a security treaty, not an alliance, but a security treaty with Indonesia in the mid 2000s, um, which was a really important piece of uh, um, regional architecture from Australia's point of view. Um, there's also been great ambition to build um, the economic relations of the region and then actually a lot of the collaboration in the region has been driven by economics. I mean, I referred to APEC. Um, I, I um, would add in much more recently the creation of the um, CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, which in effect evolved over quite some years out of, uh, out of APEC. Um, and that is really a very high quality free trade agreement involving 11 of the countries of the region. It was originally going to include the United States, but uh, um, the politics of the United States led to the United States not becoming a partner to it. And, and it still isn't. So it's true that Trump didn't want to, but Hillary Clinton didn't. And um, and now Joe Biden is showing no inclination either, which is, um, I would have to say, quite a shame. So um, it, 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 it's really important to understand this background because included in these countries is China. 
Um, and uh, China may be the most populous of those countries and its economy has now become by far the biggest. When I became the foreign minister, Japan's, um, uh, well, the United States and Japan would have been the biggest economies, but you know, China has grown hugely in the period since then. Um, and uh, it has been engaged in this architecture so when it's come to China, we have um, very much in Australia taken the view that we should collaborate with and engage with China. Um, so that included uh, at the economic level. When I became the foreign minister in 1996, China was Australia's sixth biggest trading partner. By the time I finished, it was by far our largest and now something like 30% of all Australia's exports uh, go to China. So. Uh, just in economic terms, it's become uh, hugely important to Australia. Now, um, I spent a lot of time talking about the networking in the region, but there is a security structure as well. Um, Australia has always held the view that for the security and stability of the region, the United States has to be engaged in its security architecture because take the United States out of the security architecture, We've always judged that that would lead to um, uh, difficult rivalries between countries of the region, which would spill over into security relationships. But having the United States there um, pretty much guarantees the stability of the region. Now, how do you keep the United States in a region uh, when it's geographically not very proximate? Um, and the answer to that is through its alliances. It has a very long standing alliance with, uh, with Australia, which goes back 70 years, um, called the ANZUS Alliance. Um, but it also has a very important security alliance with Japan, um, it, it, in effect underwriting the um, security of Japan. And it has uh, a well-known security alliance with um, South Korea, with the Republic of Korea. It does have treat alliance arrangements with the Philippines and Thailand as well, though they're not uh, anything like as prominent. The point to make here is that these alliances have kept the United States, if you like, anchored in the region, and in particular, the alliances with Japan um, to the north of the region and with Australia to the south of the region. Um, so this has evolved, um, including during my time as foreign minister, but evolved into um, a realization that with the rise of China, with its uh, ever growing, particularly economic, but associated with that military power, it's important to have a balance of power in the region. We have the collaborative networks that I spent quite a lot of time explaining because I don't think you read about them much in the media anymore. Um, but um, but uh, over and above that, um, there needs to be an appropriate balance of power. Um, so um, that balance of power in the, in the context of the rise of China made it, I think, um, quite practical for us to have a collaborative and constructive relationship with China whilst always accepting that China had a completely different political system um, and um, had aspirations which didn't always meet our own uh, priorities. However, this, this, has, this has really changed in recent years. So this quite easy, although there were tensions from time to time, but quite, it, I don't have time to go into, but this quite easy collaborative relationship with China uh, worked well under Jiang Zemin and, and Hu Jintao. Um, we negotiated Australia a free trade agreement with China to help enhance our trade. There was a big um, two-way flow of investment and, and so the list went on. And Australia wasn't unique here. This is true of other countries in the region. However, um, the rise of Xi Jinping has led to a substantial change in China's strategy. Um, China has become much more assertive, much more aggressive. And if you like, much more determined to impose a kind of Monroe doctrine, if I could call it that, on the um, Asia Pacific, not, not India, but on the Asia Pacific region, 
Um, and this has tested the structure and architecture that I've outlined um, already to you this morning, or this morning London time, um, and uh, has led to um, the strengthening of some of those relationships with the countries that want to make sure the balance of power continues. So China has asserted um, control, if you could call it that, in some respects over um, islands or um, islets in the uh, South China Sea in order to try to claim the South China Sea as, as China, for, for China. And it has, it has done this through military, uh, military means by militarizing these islands. Um, it's changed the nature of the relationship between Beijing and Hong Kong. There's been the controversy in Xinjiang over the treatment of the Uyghurs. Um, China has become much more assertive and aggressive in using um, um, uh, uh, cyber activities, um, um, continual attacks, including in Australia on uh, cyber attacks on uh, many of our institutions, in particular our government. And in, indeed, China has even, in the case of Australia, as you've seen more recently in the UK as well, um, become involved in. Uh, in uh, politics, in local politics, in um, developing relationships with um, politicians of one kind or another, which has been highly controversial. So um, uh, all of this um, change of tone has been reflected in what has become known as wolf warrior diplomacy by China. Um, their diplomats have had become, in, in, I say had, had become incredibly aggressive um, and abusive um, uh, in reaction to Australia calling for an international investigation in the into the causes of the COVID outbreak. China imposed a whole series of economic sanctions on Australia, including restricting or banning the purchases of Australian barley and restricting purchases of Australian wheat. I bet they regret that now. Um, uh, since, by the way, one of the countries they went to to get wheat uh, grains generally to replace Australia as a source was Ukraine. Um, so um, all of this wolf warrior diplomacy and this aggression towards Australia has led to a strengthening of the alliance arrangements in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and there are two that I would refer to. One, um, that the what was once the trilateral security dialogue, which I established with the Americans with Condi Rice um, between the Japanese, the Americans and the Australians as the great sort of allies as as we were and are, um, had added to it India. Um, you know, well, we all know the importance of India um, and its tradition of non-alignment, but this has been a very substantial change um, in the positioning of India and, if you like, in the power balance of the, of the region. And, and most recently, there has been the signing of what's called the AUKUS agreement, the Australia-UK-US agreement, which is really a, a top-level military technology transfer agreement. In media terms, the focus is on um, Australia purchasing nuclear power technology for a new generation of submarines, but it also involves, the AUKUS agreement also involves exchanges of cyber technology, digital technology, um, artificial intelligence, and, um, and so on. So, um, you know, the, 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 the aggression that China has shown in, in recent years under Xi Jinping towards other countries in the region and particularly manifested in the way Australia has been treated by China, has had, um, as President Putin is discovering, a completely counterproductive um, consequence, and that is to consolidate the liberal democracies of the region. I mean, countries that are traditionally non-aligned, like Indonesia, countries uh, uh, that um, have been very happy to benefit from economic relations with China, like Vietnam and so on. Um, these countries don't want to see China completely dominate the region. They don't want to see a Chinese Monroe Doctrine 
exercise through the Asia Pacific region and the aggression that China has shown in the last few years has very much led to these countries, um, you know, coming together uh, with a, the greater determination to balance the power of China. Um, so I know my time is nearly up, so I need to finish where I started by saying that I think the Russian invasion, um, I mean, if I, if I could say so, the really brutal Russian invasion, the 19th century style Russian invasion of its next door neighbour of Ukraine has um, created, I think, an excruciating dilemma for China. And the way China reacts to this it's uh, so far been very interesting, um, but it's going to be critical for determining um, China's relationships with, with its neighbours and, and partners in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so, you know, as luck would have it for China, on February the 4th, Xi Jinping signed his agreement, uh, 4th of February, yes, uh, signed his agreement uh, with President Putin in Beijing when President Putin was there for the... Uh, Winter Olympics, uh, where the, you know the two countries were going to become eternal friends and nothing would ever separate them. Uh, who knows whether Xi Jinping was told by President Putin that, uh, as the Americans are saying, um, that at the end of the Winter Olympics, um, Russia was going to invade Ukraine. But what Russia has done has been, if you like, completely contrary. Um, to China's policy, um, their whole notion of having a foreign policy based around the, no the, the concept of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries, of respecting the sovereignty of other countries, has of course been completely trashed by the Russians. Um, and um, uh, is China going to continue to support the policies that it has supported for so long in terms of um, uh, as I've just mentioned, the non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries, or is it going to think that this kind of aggression um, uh, is, is acceptable? And if it does think it's acceptable, and I think it's very questionable that it does, um, we still don't really know enough given the opaqueness of the Chinese system. We don't know enough about what they think. Um, but um, uh, you know, it is going to have enormous implications, this, for China's relations with the rest of the world, including the region. Um, if China is going to uh, move towards supporting what Russia has done, um, then that triggers the thought that Russia, that China itself would regard um, such actions as acceptable, for example, towards Taiwan. Um, and uh, it will lead to um, two things, the still greater strengthening of those alliances I referred to, um, the still greater um, dependence on the United States engagement with the region, uh, but also a view that the more countries in the region can move away from supply chains into and out of China, uh, the better, um, because there's trouble ahead. Um, however, I mean, I think that I think two things in conclusion. One, that I think in China, they have started to realize, um, leaving aside what Russia has done, they have started to realize in the last year or so that their wolf warrior diplomacy isn't really getting them very far. It's creating more enemies. Um, you know, as they say, uh, the United States has allies, China just has clients. Um, and um, those clients are becoming more hesitant and more wary and more nervous about China. Um, and I think, I think in Beijing, they are starting to recognize that. Um, and certainly I've noticed, because it doesn't get reported if they don't say anything aggressive, but I've noticed in recent times, the wolf warrior diplomacy has toned down. Um, the second thing I, I would say is, um, in the votes in the United Nations, both in the Security Council and in the General Assembly uh, on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, China has, of course, abstained. And some of the public statements that China has made do, I don't have them in front of me at the moment, but um, one or two of the rest of you will have seen them anyway, 
um, but they do go to the fact that they feel in Beijing a bit uneasy about what President Putin has done. Um, and like me, um, they didn't ever think Russia would do it. I mean, I personally thought um, common sense tells you that Russia wouldn't invade Ukraine because they'd get bogged down there. The sanctions would do irreparable damage to the Russian economy. Um, and um, it would all end up as a complete tragedy for them, um, which is what I think is going to happen. So for them to invade would be extremely reckless. I think China, I think China may have thought the same thing um, and they may have been taken by surprise by the Russian invasion. So this is a great opportunity for China. Um, China can lean on President Putin, because they're not supporting the sanctions against Russia, um, they can lean on President Putin uh, to ease up in Ukraine, um, to um, uh, pursue a diplomatic and peaceful path rather than um, shelling uh, maternity wards. Um, so they can they can start engaging more heavily in that um, and uh, in the diplomacy. Um, and if China does do that. I think it will reflect very well on them. Um, and I think some of the tensions that have arisen over the wolf warrior diplomacy and the aggression of China uh, will begin to ease just because of all the countries in the world that could influence President Putin and, Ch and uh, Russia at this time, uh, none equals China. China is by far the country uh, which has the most the, the potential to exercise the most influence over Russia and over President Putin. Um, so um, we look forward to them doing that. If they don't do it, if they start to back up President Putin, um, then they will still further alienate a region that they have already alienated somewhat through their wolf warrior diplomacy. And I think it would be um, a very bad course for China to take in terms of China's own interests. So a fascinating time. So thank you very much for having me on the webinar. And um, I'm very happy to uh, d discuss some of these issues a bit later. Yes, thank you very much for your fascinating insights. I think we'll circle back and discuss China and Taiwan uh, uh, with our next speaker. But Ben, I want to turn to you now to provide us with a Southeast Asia perspective of how all of this is playing out. Uh, uh, you know, I was struck by the fact that when AUKUS was originally announced, there was a sharp reaction from the Indonesian foreign minister. Uh, but then a few months later, reading uh, Prabowo Subianto, the defense minister's speech at the Manama dialogue, it was much more conciliatory uh, in the sense that Indonesia is happy to live uh, with multiple alliances with the same objective. So, you know, uh, looking forward to your insights on how all of this is playing out in Southeast Asia, including whether there's been a modulation in tone uh, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Thanks, thanks for seeking and thanks Alexander for your comments and yeah, really looking forward to joining everyone at Chatham House in, in a few months time. Um, so I'm going to talk about Southeast Asia, which really is the crucible for the sorts of great power competition that Alexander was talking about geographically. It's, it's at the center of this contest that we're seeing playing out in, in the military sphere, uh, in the economic domain, in, in the information domain as well. And I, I think Australia is in an interesting position here, being adjacent to Southeast Asia and having really deep relations with a lot of the Southeast Asian neighbors that Alexander and his uh, colleagues and successors helped to build up over the years. Um, but I think things are changing and not necessarily all for the positive when it comes to Australia and Southeast Asia. I think we have to acknowledge that there's been a really big shift in the Australian strategic mood music from three or four years ago. At that time, uh, even the, the current Prime Minister Scott Morrison and other leaders were saying that Australia would not choose sides between the US as a security guarantor and China as its biggest trading partner. Very similar language to what we, we hear all the time from, from Southeast Asian nation states. But it's clear in the intervening three or four years that a side has been chosen for Australia, albeit under duress, uh, given some of the changes that we've seen in China as Alexander laid out. So Australia now is out in the cold with Beijing. 
Uh, we know there have been the various trade sanctions, which Australia's economy has actually uh, got through in quite a resilient fashion for various reasons. We know there's been almost no high level political contact uh, between the Australian and Chinese governments for several years, uh, largely due to an embargo from Beijing. Australian ministers are happy to meet their counterparts, but those meetings are being rejected. And we can see that Australia is leaning in strongly uh, to US led efforts to counter and push back against China. Uh, as seen through initiatives like the Quad and also AUKUS, uh, of which the chief initiative is so far, uh, the plan to acquire nuclear powered submarines for Australia with US technology and UK assistance. Now, amid this environment, Australian diplomats and politicians like to talk of strategic convergence with Southeast Asian nations like Indonesia and Vietnam. But I think when it comes to their relationships with China, much of Southeast Asia and Australia are actually on diverging paths, I'm afraid to say. Uh, and that's because while Australia has moved decisively to join this US-led coalition intent on pushback against China, Vietnam, Indonesia, and pretty much the whole of Southeast Asia are hedging. So they are concerned about China's growing power, uh, China throwing its weight around in the South China Sea and in other areas, as Alexander said, but Almost all those countries have really deep trade and economic relationships with China that are growing very rapidly. They're developing countries. And they also have a lot of admiration, I think, for the way China has developed its economy in recent decades to become obviously one of the, the best performing developing economy in the world. So why I think a lot of, a lot of Southeast Asian nations want to see balance. They do want to see Australia, the US and others balancing China's growing military power. They are very restrained themselves in what they're willing to do. And they genuinely fear the impact of intensified great power competition. So it's a contradictory position in a sense, but that's the sort of contradictions that smaller nations necessarily have to live with and the struggles they have to go through when we see this great power competition around them. And Southeast Asian nations surely have a great deal to lose from intensifying competition and the outbreak potentially of military conflict, which I think explains some of those nerves that that Indonesia and Malaysia had about the announcement of the AUKUS arrangement and the nuclear powered submarines in particular. Now, diverging strategic outlooks, that doesn't mean that you can't build bilateral relationships. China has really advanced bilateral relationships with many countries, despite, as Alexander said, not really having many formal alliances, certainly beyond North Korea. And I think that's true of Australia as well. There's no reason why Canberra can't continue to intensify uh, the development of its economic, trade, political, and security relationships with the likes of Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and others. But I think we have to acknowledge that there is a real difference in how Australia and Southeast Asia is engaging China, and that that does matter. I think many Southeast Asian partners um, understand that Beijing has put Australia in a very difficult position with these trade sanctions and various demands uh, that have been handed over. And there is a degree of sympathy there. But I think the lesson that many Southeast Asian countries will learn is not that wolf warrior diplomacy is a bad idea, but that China actually has the power to enact great damage on their economies. Because if Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore were hit with the kind of sanctions that Australia has faced, I think there'd be a lot more real economic damage, which would be very worrying to their governments, given their economies are much less diversified, much less developed, and they're just geographically a lot closer, many of them sharing extensive land borders or disputed maritime boundaries as well. So I think the lesson they're gonna take is to be even more wary of upsetting Beijing. And I think there's this default for many Southeast Asian countries, which is very understandable towards neutrality. Um, some people would say unkindly, it's burying your head in the sand, but I think it's more an acknowledgement of the limits of what small countries and middle powers can do when faced with pressure from great powers. And we see this, I think, in the rather meek responses from most Southeast Asian countries to Russia's brutal and unjustified invasion of Ukraine. So Singapore uh, stands out, one of the smallest, but obviously one of the wealthiest countries in the region, as having taken a very strong stance it almost never brings economic sanctions against anyone, but they've announced economic sanctions against Russia. They've taken a very strong stance sponsoring uh, the UN, um, UN Security Council resolution that came through. And that's because Singapore, uh, while it doesn't believe in promoting democracy overseas, does believe in an international rules-based system. And it does believe in the inviolability 
of territorial integrity and sovereignty, and it's willing to stand up for that. But across the rest of the region, we've seen a variety of rather meek responses. Obviously, countries like Myanmar, Vietnam and Laos uh, that have very close relationships with Russia and buy a lot of weapons uh, from Russia have, have said very little. Um, other countries like Indonesia have spoken out a bit, calling for peace in general terms and for all sides to step down. But when it's so flagrant that one side is responsible for the conflict, it's clearly, it clearly sends a signal that Indonesia you know, is not willing to get involved in defending the international system. And I think that's partly understandable because Indonesia has many other problems and is not keen to get dragged into debating the Russia conflict when there are far more important issues, I think, as Indonesia's president Jokowi would see it, fixing the economy after the first recession since the Asian financial crisis, leading the country out of the pandemic, et cetera. And I think there is an implication here potentially for power dynamics in, in Asia, because I think this default to neutrality is what we're likely to see in Southeast Asia as great power tensions intensify as well. And although I think Southeast Asian countries understand that through ASEAN, their regional organization, they can be more powerful when they stand together. I think for every country in the world, there's usually a default to your narrow national interest at times of pressure. So I think that that's why I said earlier, we're seeing this divergence in a sense that I don't think that most Southeast Asian countries are going to bandwagon with the West against China. And a, a further point to mention here before I wrap up is that we've seen the Australian government, but also to a certain extent, the British government and the Biden administration leaning into a rhetoric of a clash of systems, democracies versus authoritarians, liberal Democrats versus tyrants. And I don't think this narrative is going to get very far in Southeast Asia for a number of reasons. Chiefly, most governments in Southeast Asia are not democracies. They're ruled by unelected leaders, uh, single ruling parties, etc. And even among the democracies like Indonesia and, and Malaysia, they don't really view themselves as liberal democracies. In fact, liberal is a dirty word in Indonesian political debate. And they're not interested in ideological conflict. So I do worry that the West is getting somewhat drunk on its own rhetoric. And while it may be very kind of convincing uh, for the UK, Australia and the US to talk about this clash of systems, and perhaps it's quite meaningful uh, for us, it doesn't really resonate with Southeast Asia. And I think that's a challenge going forward because ultimately, and I'll finish here, I think what most Southeast Asian governments want is yes, stability and prosperity, but their focus for the most part is on economic development at home. Of course, they're worried about Chinese pressure in the South China Sea. They're worried about border disputes where they have them. But by and large, they need to deliver GDP growth at home. They need to create jobs. Two to three million young Indonesians, for example, joining the workforce every year. And in that respect, most of Southeast Asia sees China as a key economic partner. There is no prospect for them of economic decoupling away from China. In fact, their economies are only becoming more integrated in terms of trade and investment with China. So I think that's why I have this concern about a divergence, if you like, between Australia and some parts of Southeast Asia, but it can be bridged. I think the key is to listen to the governments and the peoples of Southeast Asia about what they need and to try and help them meet some of these core challenges they face and to understand that the security threats that they're worried about are as often things like climate change, food prices, natural disasters, as the kind of grand security military challenges that we, especially in the, the think tank world, like to talk about. So I will leave it there and look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ben. Very, very good uh, perspective on how Southeast Asia is doing this. Uh, UG, I'd like to turn to you now. And I think uh, if, if we've one read the China-Russia Russia joint statement coming out of Xi Jinping and Putin's meeting in February, you know, declaring friendship uh, uh, without limits. I mean, does Beijing feel today, uh, following the Russian invasion and all the international blowback, you know, with friends like this, uh, who needs enemies? Uh, because uh, uh, what is unfolding in terms of uh, economic sanctions, uh, clearly the international response has been much stronger than anyone could have expected uh, at the beginning of February. So in, in your view, as China looks at the region, looks at the broader Asia-Pacific region, including Australia, 
you know, what early lessons do you think Beijing is drawing uh, 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 from this from this European crisis? Well, thank you, Vysichki. Um, also, again, thank you so much for the AIG for sponsoring this uh, webinar. I'm really delighted, looking forward to have a Ben join us in May. Um, now, to answer your question on China, I think China has already realized um, this partnership come with a substantial cost, but whether they're going to have a cost correction, I think the mode now is wait and see approach. Now, if we come back to the region, I think what China has realized is that um, within the region, perhaps the most important power, that set of power, the source of power that China will be able to exercise is on a so-called the so-called economic statecraft by using China's financial power, by using China's traditional um, trade ties and economic interdependence and try to exert inclusive influence within the region. I mean, given the fact that um, if you look into the regional cooperation economic partnership with all these 15 different countries and China has been the larger trading partner than the United States has been in the last 10 years um, anyway. So that's just one set of economic advantage that China will be able to exert within the, in the region. But however, I think that's also got compounded and also undermined by China's military might um, within the Southeast Asia region and growing um, worry from those Southeast Asian countries that perhaps China will break the security balances um, within the region as well. So I think I'm pretty much entirely agree with Ben in here that the Southeast Asian countries are not necessarily bandwagoning towards the United States wholeheartedly, but on the other hand, they would choose very carefully on which side and which sector and which topic to be side with China and which topic and they would side with, um, with the West, for example, in this case. But I think China also realized um, perhaps Again, just to continue on that economic theme, and China already joined membership of RCEP. And also, um, just to be clear that RCEP is not led by China, it's led by ASEAN, and China deliberately letting um, ASEAN lead the way as the negotiation strategy, the ASEAN way, so that take eight years to conclude the trade, um, the trade block. Now, um, secondly, China is at the moment also joined the, um, the bidding of the CPTPP. Whether China will be able to get it, and that's another question because that would really require um, some fundamental domestic economic reform, um, especially in terms of state owned enterprises and so on and so forth. But what China's determination and also the timing that China announcing to join CPTPP is just actually two days after the AUKUS deal has been announced. So China, what it's trying to do is trying to signaling the region that fine, if the liberal democracy does the security pack and therefore what you have from Beijing is the economic pack and prosperity, which would potentially benefit towards the region. So that is one strong signal that Beijing has sent to its Southeast Asian neighbors and answering their concern. Now, secondly, while well, I heard both speakers um, mentioned the so-called war for a diplomacy, um, I think, again, there seems to be some sense of course correction within Beijing as well. I mean, on the one hand, what we have seen so far is the economic reality, both domestic economic reality and also the external environment for China that require China to have sound trade relationship with Southeast Asia countries, with United States, as well as with Europe. But on the other hand, um, is diplomacy also compounded by this quite toxic diplomatic rhetoric that essentially may ultimately harm the China's economic growth for itself. And perhaps that's the last thing the Chinese Communist Party, the leadership would like to see. So I'm hoping there will be some cross correction in here when it comes to the war for a diplomacy, especially towards the region. Because overall, um, what China have in mindset, especially when it comes to is a foreign policy delivery, it is very much based on whether this foreign policy would be conducive towards its own domestic economic um, development. Now, I think another lesson um, what Beijing has learned so far is, well, Beijing has introduced the so-called dual circulation strategy back in 2020, May 2020, just in the after, right aftermath of the pan of COVID pandemic for China and inside China, and was hoping that could really rely on domestic demand and supply that would be able to generate the Chinese economy. But I think, however, over the last two years, and the Chinese authority and economic planners realized Perhaps China still have to rely on the earning from the export in order to generate a reasonable amount of the GDP growth. And therefore, the layer of the dual circulation, the key thing the word is dual is two. So the external circulation and therefore the export have become ever more important. 
Now, I think really an early lesson for the Chinese authority has learned so far in this Ukraine crisis as well, is about this dual circulation, it's about this external circulation, that perhaps the trade and the partnership, and especially with a variety, with the different sectors of trade and economic interconnectivities and interdependence, that would lead the Western uh, powers and also Western companies less reluctant to leave to China and less re reluctant to sanction, to imposing sanction towards China, like what the Western companies and also the government have done towards Russia. So I think that's the first early lesson. Now, second lesson which the Chinese has learned from this current crisis, as well as towards Indo-Pacific, is that while we're talking about supply chain quite a lot in the region, and China is also concerned about its own supply chain issue as well. Now, the recent rhetoric come from Beijing was firstly that Beijing will have to take in the so-called thrifty strategy. Thrifty strategy, which means that um, Beijing will have to um, save its resources and utilize its resources at the most effective way um, in order to avoid any further supply disruption and therefore have a different, um, therefore different kind of purchasing styles and mannerism, firstly. Now, secondly, China has also clearly stayed out by saying, um, we're going to introduce an export ban. Um, so you've seen China has issued the export ban white paper in the beginning of the year. And it's really a deliberate way to try to protect its own supply chain at the same time. So I think this is a supply chain um, issue, not just concern for, for the West and also for the region, but it's also a major concern for China itself as well. I mean, Alex was earlier talking about um, the, the grain supply from Ukraine. So I think China has its best interest of not dragging this Ukraine conflict for much longer, because what I've noticed that around 80% of the Chinese um, uh, corn Corn fed. So basically, corn is uh, is the um, is the, the food for feeding the pigs, and which pork can actually as being one of the major consumption for the Chinese household. And therefore, that price was goes up, and then also China will felt like its own supply chain dis um, disruption for that particular sector, which would increase in the household um, um, household cost of living and also pump inflation as well. So China has a very strong interest in here of not letting this war to drug for much longer, to having much of the economic damage firstly. Now, secondly, this is also come to the international reputation issue as well. For China, after last of few years, while we have the war for diplomacy, we also have this COVID issue, and bounded by that reputation that what China wants to do is China really showing itself as being a responsible stakeholder, like what Bob Zolik said in the past. And Perhaps not. Um, so what China's trying to do now is perhaps want to step out and showing some limited interest that playing a mediation role in here in order to save its own international reputation firstly, but secondly, this is also not, as I said earlier, it's not on economic and political interest for China as this crisis uh, dragged along. So whether China will be able to finally step out um, to making a, a real meaningful mediation, let's wait and see. But I think the earlier responses in Beijing itself is it wants to distance itself from Russia. It wants to show the rest of the world China is still very much a power of peace, a force for peace and a force for good, and less so compared with Russia. Because by all means, that even if you have no limit in terms of cooperation, but that no limit, I think is up to one point. It can only up to a certain point when it comes to military when it comes to economic collaboration. I mean, if we look into the military cooperation for between Beijing and Moscow, it has been quite close in the recent years, but Moscow is also quite very about China's People's Liberation Army modern, modernization firstly. And secondly, if you look into the joint declaration on the 4th of February, that actually you found more disagreement than agreement. If you look into the document very carefully, I mean, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is one of the flagship initiatives put forward by Xi Jinping, for many years, and China was much hoping that Russia would be able to endorse this, endorse this agreement and work together with Beijing. But however, I think the responses from Russia has always been lukewarm. And again, it has been showed in the stronger declaration, um, putting only for, put forward a word saying, um, Moscow would be interested in coordinating on the Eurasia Economic Union and the BRI, but not necessarily use the word of cooperation and also further enhancing 
their um, coordination on this at all. Now, secondly, if China interested in become an international player when it comes to global governance at various UN platform and also on various multilateral platform, and Russia, I'm afraid, is not able to help China um, previously and now not um, even this stage as well, given its international uh, reputation damage. And then lastly, that um, Russia is very much aware of China's economic expansion within the Central Asia, which traditionally been seen as the backyard of Russia's own spheres of influence, and therefore was hoping that, um, um, China was hoping to have some economic gain and energy supply gain um, for Central Asia. But ultimately, Russia sees China's economic activity will ultimately lead into an increasing military presence um, within Central Asia region and therefore would really undermine Russia's sphere of influence as well. So I think both China and Russia are now, we come to the moment that, yes, we have the marriage of convenience. We have because of Russia's marching towards the East of foreign policy. But I wouldn't necessarily say, even if they have declared their partnership has no limit. But I think when it comes to the fundamental issues on territorial integrity, as what the presidency and the various Chinese senior diplomats emphasized very strongly, that territorial integrity and UN Charter need to be preserved. And I think China has been quite serious about it. All in all, that China is a 21st century great power that exerting its influence through economic statecraft. And however, Russia is a 19th century territorial great power that exerting its influence through military conquest. And when China realized, um, are they really on the same boat? Um, if perhaps Russia cannot really deliver the interest that China was hoping for, and China would drop, will drop Russia discreetly and very quietly. So I think that's perhaps will be able to sum up as the current state of the partnership. Thanks a lot, Eugene. Now we have only have 10 minutes or more so I just wanted to give each one of our panelists uh, uh, opportunity to give us some closing remarks. Starting with you, Alexander, just wanted to get your sense. I mean, Russia has accused the US of waging economic warfare, uh, but obviously we see the, in the Australia-China context, Australia has been subjected to economic warfare over the past year in terms of sanctions and limitations on trade. Uh, so now, has this led to a fundamental rethinking of Australia's overall approach towards China? Uh, you know, uh, reflect on this and 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 any other thoughts that you may have. But ben, I just wanted to get a sense from you on how this new Indo-Pacific strategy unveiled by the Biden administration. I mean, is it resonating or not in Southeast Asia? And UGA, finally, last but not least, if you can talk a little bit about uh, what all of this means for Taiwan. Alexander, starting with you. Um, well, uh, no, it's not leading to a, a rethink by Australia at all. I think Australia feels very confident that, um, that it, uh, it is, if you like, on the right side of history in dealing with these difficult issues with China. And I mean, um, you know, you has been talking about this, um, and I did too in my remarks, there is a real question mark about whether China is going to continue with its wolf warrior diplomacy. And my sense is that they've had some reconsideration in Beijing uh, uh, out of the, over the virtue of it. Um, and secondly, um, yes, I mean, I, I, I think this a very interesting issue about China and Russia and uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I, I might be wrong, but I do think that China feels very uncomfortable about it. It's not going, they're not going to cut their links straight away with Russia. But I think they've got themselves into a difficult position. I mean, they, they impose these sanctions on Australia, but I mean, what's the use of that? Um, it led to huge increases in energy costs, which have, you know, then there are other forces that are lifting energy costs, but it led to shortages of coal because they stopped buying Australian coal. Um, they now have problems with grain. Grain prices are going through the roof um, because of Ukraine and they became quite dependent on Ukraine as a source for grain. Um, so, I mean, I just have to say there's, there's a sort of assumption in foreign policy circles that China is run by some technical series of 
or a group of technocratic geniuses who never make a mistake. And I think they've made an absolute mess of their foreign policy in the last few years. And common sense tells me, mind you, common sense told, told me the Russians would never invade Ukraine because it would never lead anywhere good for them, and they did it. Uh, but common sense and uh, common sense tells me that China will reevaluate. Um, this notion, by the way, that's coming through in this whole seminar that uh, webinar that that economics is what ultimately it's all about is is proven time and time again through history as as being untrue. Economics is important but it's not what it's all about. Um, and, you know, it, China, China um, uh, is learning, I think, that you can't just go around and threaten other countries with, you know, economic consequences and expect them to obey. It just, it doesn't work like that. And the last point I'd make is in relation to Southeast Asia. Yes, you know, I spent a big chunk of my diplomatic life working with the ASEAN countries. They like, to, um, they like to express a sort of non-aligned neutrality towards great, uh, in great powers and great international issues. And there are all sorts of historic reasons that are worth examining in a different context from this um, as to why that is the case, but it is the case. Um, it, however, what they say publicly and what they think and say privately are often two very different things. So I know Indonesia very well. Um, the Indonesia, in Indonesia doesn't want to end up with um, a conflict with uh, a, a trade war with China or anything like that. Of course they don't. Um, and it is one of the founders of the non-aligned movement after all. But Indonesia doesn't want to see China dominate the Indo-Pacific region any more than Australia does or India does. Uh, how they play that um, is a different matter. But um, privately, the Indonesians have always been um, more, if you like, pro-American and pro, well, not always been, but in, in the last couple of decades, more pro-American and pro-Western than they ever professed to in their public statements. And you'll find that in other parts of Southeast Asia as well. ASEAN, ASEAN is... Um, uh, it, it professes neutrality, but uh, privately, it doesn't want to see the region swallowed up by China. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Thanks, thanks, Suzuki. Um, just, just on that last point, um, you know, the Lowe Institute has actually just done a big opinion poll across Indonesia. Um, we interviewed 3,000 people, a scientifically significant sample across the country to ask them about some of these questions. So the results will be out soon. And I think it will shed some interesting light on how Indonesians feel um, about China and the US and Australia and, and, other, and other powers. Um, but, and of course there are private conversations you know, with Chinese counterparts too, where uh, they also tell Indonesia and others tell China lots of nice things about collaboration. So I do think those conversations probably cut both ways. Um, you asked uh, Vasuki about the US's Indo-Pacific strategy and the economic element there. And I think that's quite important for Southeast Asia. Obviously across the region, people have been glad to see a return to a normal US diplomacy after the Trump administration. And I think what they are looking for now is some greater economic engagement, because I do think that of course, while security issues matter uh, for most Southeast Asian governments, you know, the key focus is delivering you know, economic development. Uh, and so they want to see something from the US, but I think they're going to be disappointed uh, that, you know, the Biden administration has said that something's coming up very soon. But what they've also said, and Alexander laid out the reasons why in US domestic politics, is that there won't be any improved access to the US economy. There won't be any congressional permissions granted uh, to allow this, uh, this Indo-Pacific economic framework to give significant um, kind of offer economically to, to the region. So I, I'm afraid it's going to be a bit of a nothing burger to use the US terminology and that there's really not going to be much there because quite frankly, if the Congress and the administration isn't willing to sign off on opening up to a trade deal or signing back into the CPTPP, which they helped to launch, then I don't really see what they can offer that's significant. So, so I think that's going to be a bit of a challenge. But of course, Southeast Asian countries broadly are really happy to see the US 
engaging more in other respects. And I know there's meant to be an ASEAN US summit coming up, although potentially being delayed again because of recent events. And I think that that's a positive sign. And as Alexander said, I definitely think across all the Southeast Asian capitals, even in Cambodia and Laos, which are often sometimes seen as Chinese satellites, I think wrongly, I think even there, they're glad to see some sort of balance because there are there are nerves about you know, the, the increasing power of the PLA in China and kind of growing assertion, assertiveness uh, of the Chinese government. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Uh, UJ, you know, looking at uh, Russia, Ukraine, we may never know the answer to this question, but you know, will there be a recalculation on the part of China on how it looks at the Taiwan question? Okay, the short answer is yes and no. Um, I think the, the, the let, let's, let me go to the no answer um, is, I think part of the reason why the Chinese foreign minister and also president try to strongly emphasize on the UN charter and also on national sovereignty and territorial integrity. It is already tried to indicate that it's incompatible between Ukraine and Taiwan because Ukraine is a full UN member and therefore what Russia has done is really is one UN member attacked another UN member and therefore the national sovereignty has been infringed. So I think Beijing made this point very clear precisely for the reason that there was a bit really a fear and afraid that perhaps many of the commentators and foreign affairs community in the West want to compare this with Taiwan. So while well, Taiwan is not a full UN member and therefore um, when it comes to various issues, there's a lot of strategic ambivalence within it. I mean, if you're thinking about 1979 Taiwan, for Taiwan Act and so on and so forth. So I think Beijing would prefer not to let the international community compare with this between Taiwan and Ukraine. But the, my short answer for yes is that this perhaps prompt Beijing to rethink just in case it's a military escalation what are the consequences for China? Would China would be slapped by such a titanic volumes of sanction as well? And also how careful that Beijing would have to prepare, I mean, if the worst case scenario and the worst had happened. So that might be prompt Beijing to rethink for that. But I think overall what we would have is we would have a very, very intense standoff across the street between Taipei and Beijing in the next decade or so but not necessarily a military escalation because it's not really in the China's interest to do so while having gone through a very painful economic transition at the same time domestically. They simply cannot afford to do that. So once the uh, economic slowdown will translate into pain for every single household, I think then at, for that point, the Chinese leadership's legitimacy will be called in question. So what we have is we're gonna have a very intense military standoff, but not necessarily a full-blown military escalation. I think Beijing will be very careful for that. And that's not really in Beijing's interest to do so. On this hopeful note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've unfortunately run out of uh, time. My apologies again for not being able to go through the questions sent by uh, our participants. Uh, hopefully we can continue this discussion in the future. I want to wrap up by thanking AIG for supporting the Chatham House AIG webinar series. Uh, we've had four very interesting conversations during the course of the last 12 months. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers uh, today, Alexander Downer, UGA, and Ben Bland. And as we noted before, this uh, webinar has been recorded. We'll make that available in the next few weeks. So thank you very much uh, again for your participation. And uh, hopefully when we meet next time, uh, what we are witnessing in, in Ukraine uh, uh, will lead to a peaceful resolution. Thank you all very much.